106th day of class, and we're going to start where we always start on the class Moodle page. Here we are in Unit 4. And if I scroll down to Day 106, our lesson on Japan, and here's the assignment, Day 106 assignment. And if you click on that, um, I wanted you to dig deep into a reading today. And next year, when you take your SAT, training with readings like this will have a better outcome. And it's good to lay the groundwork now. And I divided you um, into pairs, and one person handled the Tokugawa part of Japan, and then the second person handled the Meiji Restoration. And to this day, I don't know why uh, people confuse Japan and China. So let's keep it real basic here. Uh, there's 10 times the number of Chinese people on the planet than there are Japanese people. China is geographically enormous and diverse. Uh, Japan are four main islands the size of California. And even though in the very early parts of Japanese history there was significant Chinese influence, uh, that was a long time ago. Japan has a very separate culture, separate history. So let's get, get that out of the way right now. And I still have students who get confused by that. And like I said, you were in pairs, and I had one person write down the old identities, the Tokugawa Japan. I had one person uh, write down the Meiji Restoration after 1868, and then the middle column of a Venn diagram, things they share in common. So for those who are absent or those who need to see it again, here are the answers. And Japan, from its roots to the Meiji Restoration. And if you go back a long time ago to the Yamato period, this is the period that had significant Chinese influence in terms of Confucianism and the way the language was structured and Buddhism in Chinese art and architecture. But that was a very long time ago. And then uh, the second period, the Heian period, is where Japan started getting its own identity. It started to move away from these Chinese foundations and discover its own identity in terms of having, um, you know, its first novel and moving away. It wasn't overnight, but gradually finding your own voice. And I liken it to United States history, uh, getting away from England. In, in this day and age, we're a long ways away from it. But if we were to go back to the 1790s, there was significant influence. But over time, you develop your own style, your own culture, your own autonomy. And Yorimoto follow, founded the uh, Kamakura Shogunate, again, a further move away from these Chinese roots. And I want to reiterate a point. Feudalism happened in Japan, just like it happened in Europe and in Russia, a very familiar pyramid. Now, instead of, you know, lords and vassals, we have daimyos. Instead of knights, we have samurai. But feudalism, this uh, political, economic, and social system based upon loyalty, land, military service, was uh, the way people were doing business uh, for a long, long time, for many centuries all over the world. just want to reiterate that point. And when you talk about Japanese culture, you have to talk about the code of Bushido. And Bushido was a code you lived by, I, I don't even have the words, not just strongly, it was your be-all, end-all. Adhering to this code was essential to the point if you didn't, uh, death was favorable than living with this dishonor, fidelity, uh, being loyal to whomever, whether it would be um, whoever you're fighting for or your, your fellow samurai, whomever. Uh, politeness, you always conducted yourself like a gentleman. You conducted yourself with a conduct that set you apart from everybody else. Virility is physical strength and skill and simplicity. It wasn't a very elaborate life. You didn't have a lot of material possessions, but you adhered to this code of Bushido. And if you failed to follow this code, you would commit seppuku, which is ritual suicide. Uh, you would kneel down upon a mat. You would write a poem. Then you would take your short sword and make a, a seven or a V across your waistline and up to your heart. And dying with honor was better than living with the dishonor if you violated this code of Bushido. And the Ashikaga age was full of a civil war. Now, the civil wars in Japan lasted a very long time. Chaotic, but this was the age of the samurai constantly fighting. Again, 
The Japanese Civil War lasted close to 700 years, and this was an age synonymous with that fighting. And here's an example of the architecture at the time, beautiful place, um, and very advanced, as you can see. That's a no-brainer there. And here's a turning point, the Battle of Sekigahara. Now, this ended the Japanese Civil War and began the era of the Tokugawa shogunate, or the Edo period, if you will. And here's a primary source, and you can see this ending of the Civil War. And that ushered in a good time. The Tokugawa shogunate lasted for 268 years, also called the Edo period, and many changes, for the most part positive, including the standardization of coins and weights, so making money was easier, uh, having commerce and trade and industry was better, infrastructural improvement. Infrastructure is stuff we all use, canals and roads and bridges and pipes in the ground. Infrastructure, uh, you can never go wrong. If you have a strong infrastructure, you have a strong country. Um, improved legal codes, economic gains, things are going really well. Uh, peace, prosperity, literacy, one of the highest literacy rates in the world. People are improving their minds and becoming more intellectual and creating the fruits of such intellectualism. And then Commodore Perry showed up in 1853. Now, Commodore Perry, Matthew Perry, was an American. And when he showed up, it um, put a, Japan at a, a real um, disadvantage. Uh, Japan just was not able to, quite frankly, hang with these powerful Western nations. But this sparked a change. This sparked something deep within the Japanese psyche to say, we will never be anybody's whipping boy again. We will never be mistreated by any nation, uh, yet alone a Western nation. A little historical perspective for you. Here is the American perspective. Here is Commodore Perry, the picture there was in the newspaper and the books, and here is his boat, the U.S.-Japan fleet, carrying the gospel of God to the heathen, and you have the sunset, and the white caps, and it's beautiful. Here's the Jap Japanese rendering of Perry. Okay, that's not the most uh, flattering picture. They did not like him, and his boat, you can see the black billowing smoke and the black boat. It looks like some sort of demon or something. I don't know what the heck this is. People hanging off. Um, it was not a positive to the Japanese people at all, because economically speaking, the Americans took advantage of the Japanese very badly. So they decided to implement a change. And here's where the revolution, um, the spark of the revolution, the revolution was called the Meiji Restoration. 1868. America had our revolution in 1776. Theirs was 1868. And um, they had to uh, had a short civil war to end the Tokugawa rule, uh, showed famously by the movie The Last Samurai, if you want to check out that movie. And they became Western in government, in politics, in industry, in banking, in science, and education, and values. And, you know, food for thought, I gave the analogy in class about uh, me being a kid, being a wrestler. If there's somebody who is absolutely just whomping on my head and, and beating me, I better think, what do I have to do to hang with this person? I better copy their methods. I better, why are they taking me down? Okay, I'm going to use their takedown. I, I'm not as strong as them. I have to get myself stronger. You have to do what you have to do to put yourself on a position of equality or superiority, and it's not easy. And Japan had to scrap a lot of their old cultural ways to get to that point, but it was successful. Um, it even replaced the religion. The Buddhism was replaced for the most part with Shintoism, which promoted order and allegiance and nationalism to Japan. They adopted Western hairstyles and clothing and hygiene and adopted Western uh, calendar and metric systems. So going back to this, hopefully here's the Tokugawa. Here is Meiji Restoration. In terms of this middle part of the Ven, you know, Japan has always been able to mix old traditions at the same time progressing and moving forward. And this mix has made them a very powerful nation throughout history. Ritual and honor has always been part of the Japanese story, whether it be the older um, periods or whether it be today, um, conducting yourself with honor work ethic, improvement, technology. There's, these have been the commonalities of Japanese culture throughout its time. So um, another revolution, uh, one of many, the Meiji Restoration and how Japan uh, went from its old samurai roots to a world power. Thank you for watching.